Hello everyone, welcome to our lesson study. Today we are on lesson nine, where we are talking about the book of Psalms. We are continuing studying the book of Psalms. My name is Makawe Lunga, and I'll ask my fellow panelists to introduce themselves. Hello friends, my name is Ivan Swindy, and I'm delighted to be part of this discussion once more. Uh, greetings to all viewers, my name is Takuna Kao Kuporuno. Hi there, my name is Jason, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity and great privilege you've given us to come and discuss your word, uh, fill our discussions with wisdom, light, and grace. I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Our title for today's lesson is, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And our memory text is in the book of Psalm, chapter 118, verse 22 and 23. I'll read in the book, uh, in the Bible from the New King James Version. It says, the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. This was the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Now, at the very center of the Bible is the man Jesus Christ. God, uh, in his fullness, is God. He is the man who came and lived amongst men. And right, right throughout the Bible, from Genesis up to Revelation, Jesus is depicted depicted in his fullness. The Bible reveals Jesus Christ. And the book of Psalms is no exception, right? There is a lot to say about Jesus Christ in the book of Psalms. And this is what we're going to look at today, the messianic prophecies that are in the book of Psalms. And we are going to also probably juxtapose with how they were fulfilled in the, in the New Testament. But before we really dive deep into it, right, allow me to ask this question. Since we are saying that the Book of Psalms has a lot of prophecies about Jesus Christ, the Messiah. Should we expect that uh, the Book of Psalms has a word-for-word -word explanation of the life, ministry, and, 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 and death of Jesus Christ? And just connected with that question, um, to us who are reading the Psalms today, and the New Testament, it's easy to then say, oh, these guys were writing about the Messiah because we are looking back, right? Mm -hmm. But the guys who were writing at that time, did they know that they were writing about the Messiah? Did they have a full understanding of what they were writing? I hope I'm, I'm making it clear, the question, so that as we start, it's, it's more clear where we are going with this. It's clearly difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's clearly difficult. Right. Yeah. I think... Um, it is okay. I will say it is clear, clear because I have the advantage of what you are talking about. It yes. is clear, at least to us, in terms of what we have done from lesson one to lesson eight. Yeah. Right. That um, the Psalms play a, a typological role, mm -hmm. right? In 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 in, in the messianic uh, prophecies, yeah. right? Yeah. In the, how we come to that conclusion, right? We come to that conclusion by by asking ourselves. Uh, Two questions and probably doing one dead thing. Okay. Right. The first thing that we do to, to, to arrive at that is determining the intended messaging of the Old Testament writing. Okay. In this case, Psalms. Yes. So when you look at the Psalm, you need to understand mm. the intended uh, meaning of what the Psalmist was writing about okay. at the time it was written. Okay. 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 That's the first, first stage, yeah. right? Then the second stage, after, after then doing that, right, we then have to then ask yourself, right, uh, um, we then have to determine the New Testament understanding of the same passage. Okay. Right, and then see how the New Testament understanding of the same passage incorporates the intended message of the, what, of, of the Old Testament. Yeah. Right, then of course the third thing, the third easy thing then to then do is then to then adjust accordingly. Yeah. And then when you adjust accordingly, you, you then know that uh, w what was typifying Christ, what was not. Okay, 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 okay. That makes sense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. it does. It does. And, and just to add on to what he has said, it must have been lesson one when uh, we, we discussed on how to read the Psalms. Yes. We mentioned that these Psalms were human responses to experiences and an expression of their relationship and their expectations 
to God. So to answer that question directly, where you asked us whether if we say a psalm is messianic, we mean that it, everything in the psalm talks about Jesus. Mm -hmm. My answer to that is no. We cannot expect it word for word. And in that same lesson one, we also say that the voice of the speaker may change in each line in the psalm. And we say that in one line, it is clearly the voice of God. In another line, it, without warning, there is another voice, maybe the, the speaker's own voice, blending the, 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 what we, we now have come to interpret as divine prophecies with maybe their reality at the time. Okay. So um, we have that advantage, as you mentioned earlier, that we're looking at these things in, in, ret in retrospect and we can now compare and say, okay, we are matching this and that. Those people did not have that. They were responding, their experiences, their res relationships with God, taking, trying to hold God accountable also to his promises to say, why have you not fulfilled this? We are suffering and so on. They did not have that advantage. Okay. So we cannot expect each psalm to have every word to be about Christ. But when we say they are messianic psalms, we mean that there are some elements which when we look back now, yeah. we can safely say this matches with the life or the mission that Jesus lived for. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> we are saying that these are not like uh, uh, that when the uh, prophet or the psalmist was writing, he sat down and said, now I'm writing about Jesus in the future. Yeah. He was probably writing about his own life, mm -hmm. which then has a twofold fulfillment sometimes, mm -hmm. or writing about his own present circumstances, yeah. which then gets to be fulfilled also in there. He, he lacked depth perception. Okay. I don't believe anyone who wrote the Bible knew they were writing a part of the Bible. Okay. Um, I, I don't believe Isaiah told his friends at some point that, hey, you guys should have seen the biblical chapter I wrote yesterday. It's going <laughs> to be mwah, you know? <laughs> but they, they, were, they were inspired by the, the Holy Spirit to write. Um, uh, it should be Second Peter 1, verse 20 and 21, I think, mm -hmm. where he says, holy men were inspired to write. Yes. So it's, yes. uh, the, the Bible is not a dictation by, okay. by God. It's... Um, it's God revealed himself to those who wrote it and they wrote it in their own words. But of course, God um, cooperated with them in that. that. So to, to bring that here to the Psalms, um, to illustrate what the other two gentlemen have said, uh, I'm gonna jump from the Psalms a bit okay. to, to Jesus speaking to his disciples in Matthew 24. Okay. And uh, he told his disciples, look, um, this temple is gonna be completely destroyed. And the disciples asked him, when will this be and when will the end of the world be? Because yeah. for them, that was one and the same thing. Yeah. And Jesus looks at his friends and thinks, you know, these guys, they can't handle. <laughs> there was no way they could handle that there's going to be more than a thousand years yeah. in between the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the world. So what he did was he, he spoke with, uh, with no depth perception. It's almost two dimensional. Uh, he spoke of the destruction of Jerusalem and the destruction of the world in, in the same sentence. So for us reading later on, we, we learn that the, the, the better we understand the destruction of Jerusalem, mm -hmm. the better we understand the end of the world. Okay. 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 So if you actually have to find out the events that led to the end of Jer Jerusalem mm -hmm. to help you, and, and then you can map that to see what Jesus was saying about the end of the world. Okay. So it comes back here. And he said something that was important to them. He said, I've told you what will happen before time. So that when it happens, uh, your I think your faith will be strengthened or something of the sort. So the same here for us is you have a psalmist who's writing a song. He's in, he's been inspired by the Holy Spirit to write a song or a poem, and later on, as Jesus does stuff, it the lights go on in the in in the disciples' heads to say, you know what that that sound that sounds like a, a song. We that song that I remember that psalm I remember. This sounds like what the that psalm, uh, that psalmist wrote, okay. that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And actually Jesus comes and, and, and you remember after he, he, he was resurrected, mm -hmm. he comes and he says when he met those guys on the road, he explained yeah. to them 
from the prophets, the sounds and everything. Yeah, yeah. And then he started to make things clear so that it's, it's, it was clearly portrayed to them that, oh, yeah, yeah. what was said then is exactly what, what, what has been yeah. Yeah. now. And I think also critical to understand typology, right? As we intimated on typology a few seconds ago, yes. right? Is that uh, in typology, the ideals espoused in the, in the type are often fulfilled in the antitype. Yes. Right. But not every bit of the type yes. is then met in the what? In the, in the antitype. antitype. Yeah. Okay. okay. I hope that makes yes, sense. For example, when we say that uh, the lamb is in the sanctuary, we're typifying Jesus. Yes. Right. We are just talking about the lamb basically. Yes. Right. We're not talking about every part of the lamb. Yes. Oh, I'm hoping you're hearing on yes, right. the example yeah. that comes. We always say that Joseph was a type of Christ. Christ yeah. But not everything about, about Joseph like, typifies. See Jesus running away from Potiphar's wife. Right. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we don't even see him getting married like Joseph. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. So it's 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 the basic ideal. Yes. That typifies the antitype. Yes. So yes. similarly. The, some of the passages that we will then read, mm -hmm. right, typify Jesus, right? Though, of course, we need to be careful not to come out swinging and say they were predicting Jesus. Okay. They were typifying him. Okay. Though okay. Not necessarily predicting him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 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 Thanks for that clarification. And it also helped us, I think today's lesson will also help us to come to a full appreciation of the unity of the scriptures to say that whatever the prophets wrote in the Old Testament is fulfilled in the New Testament. You cannot say, I'll stick to the New Testament alone and ignore the Old Testament. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. those yeah. two speak to each other mm -hmm. and the scriptures have a unity yeah. that we all must understand that you can say, I prefer this piece and not this piece. Yes. Right? Right. Let's, let's, let's look at some of the uh, messianic prophecies that are found in the book of Psalm. Let's start with the concept of Jesus Christ being the shepherd. So we're going to read, we won't read Psalm 23, it's a common passage. Uh, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and it goes all the way up to verse six. So let's pick Psalm 28 verse nine, Psalm 8 verse one. Maybe Uspin will read for us Psalm 28 verse nine. Jason, you will read Psalm 80 verse one. TK, you read Psalm 79, verse 13. We said we went Psalm 28, Eight, verse 9. Yes. And I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Yes. It says, Save your people and bless your inheritance. Shepherd them also and bear them up forever. Okay. Thank you. Jason? Okay. Um, Psalm 80, verse 1. <clears throat> I'm reading from the contemporary English version. Okay. And it says, Shepherd of Israel, you lead the descendants of Joseph, and you sit on your throne above the winged creatures. Okay. Listen to our prayer and let your light shine. Okay. Okay. Seventy nine verse 18 says, So we, thy people, and the sheep of thy pasture, will give thee thanks forever. Mm -hmm. We will show forth thy praise to all generations. Okay, then I'll read Psalm 100 verse 3, which says, Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that had made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Now this is talking about, okay, some of the verses will sound like they are talking about the king of Israel at the time, mm -hmm. who was shepherding the flock. So let's try and bring this to the understanding that uh, who what what is in those in those verses that we read that points out to the image of Jesus as the shepherd of his people and the relationship that the shepherd has to his people yeah. well first um, shepherds we are talking about protection mm -hmm. and uh, Jesus is our king his role, um, he is our principal power. We rely on his sovereign power against uh, the principalities. The scripture tells us that we wrestle not against the flesh. flesh, flesh. So Jesus is our protection. Then another aspect that is brought out also is the sustaining care. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. A shepherd looks after his, his sheep, their day-to-day -day needs. In fact, as you read this, the history of these people who were shepherds, you, you find that the shepherd would actually go ahead of his flock and check for pastures and then lead them to where the grass is green mm -hmm. and make sure that they are well fed. Okay. And as Christians, <clears throat> Jesus is our shepherd in that same manner. Okay. He fulfilled that during his time on earth and he still fulfills it. Now we believe that he is the one who looks after our needs. So those are some of the aspects that come out when Jesus is portrayed it as the shepherd. So the, 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 we, we, we say now these Psalms that we read, they are messianic because they also fit into those uh, categories of shepherdship that Jesus also showed when he was in the world and he has continued to show to those who believe in him. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, in his own words here, Jesus, I'm reading from John 10, um, Jesus. verse 11. Verse 11. Okay. He says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd gives up his life for his sheep. Hired workers are not like the shepherd. They don't own the sheep, and when they see a wolf coming, they run off and leave the sheep. Okay. Then the wolf attacks and scatters the flock. Hired workers run away because they don't care about the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and they know me. Just as the Father knows me, I know the Father, and I give up my life for my sheep. Mm. I have other sheep that are not in this sheep pen. I must also bring them together when they hear my voice. Then there will be one flock of sheep and one shepherd. Uh, the Father loves me because I gave up my life so that so I may receive it back again. No one takes my life from me. I give it up willingly. I have the power to give it up and the power to receive it back again, just as my Father commanded me to do. Mm -hmm. And so here you find Jesus um, pulling in the motif of, of the shepherd, yeah. which is uh, redolent of the Psalms, yeah. um, because we, we've read just a few of the Psalms in which um, uh, God's rule, the, the rule of the, the Son of God, in a sense, is, is likened to that of, of a shepherd leading mm. his sheep, mm. which would not have been foreign to the people of the time, because in, in, in the book of Samuel, one of the books of Samuel, uh, a king is, is shown to be um, a shepherd, is, is seen as a shepherd. Yes. So there's the idea of sheep, sheep are dependent on, they're completely dependent on the shepherd. Yeah. Um, the shepherd has to uh, look for pasture and then uh, look out for, for their diseases and then look out for uh, marauding animals that can attack them. Okay. So being a shepherd is a full-time job. Okay. But Jesus says, I take it even further. I'm not like a hired shepherd who runs when things get, mm -hmm. too, get too tense. Mm -hmm. I'm even going to die for, for my sheep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 It's powerful. Right. And then also um, Isaiah chapter 14, mm -hmm. verses 10 to 11, mm -hmm. um, also show us that in Jewish speak, God was always likened to a shepherd. Okay. Uh, verse 10 says, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He shall feed his flock like a shepherd. Okay. And he shall gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom, mm -hmm. and shall gently lead those that are with young. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So in Jewish speak, it's it's not a miss for for God to be likened to what to a shepherd because actually he is a shepherd, mm -hmm. right? In in two in two ways, mm -hmm. uh, God is a shepherd uh, to the Israelites because he's the one who leads them, mm -hmm. whether leads them out of Egypt or leads them into captivity. It is God who's doing the what the leading, the leading. and they are doing the following. Mm -hmm. And even in terms of behavior of Israel. Mm -hmm. Sheep are actually stupid animals, mm. strictly speaking. It's, if a most help, helpless animal is a sheep, mm -hmm. right? Extremely reliant on the shepherd, shepherd. For, guidance, for guidance and help, mm. right? And, 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 and the Bible calls us sheep. It's not actually talking about an intelligent, intelligent animal. No, no, no. Mm. And that's human beings exactly outside of God. Yeah. Uh, outside of God, we are we are exceedingly foolish, mm. right, and, and, and helpless. And unless the shepherd makes decisive interventions, mm. the sheep die. Okay. 
right? And then probably the, the next point, they also linked to the, the, what I, I have just said. To the Jewish mind also, the, the role of shepherd is, is, is a, it's a respectable trait. Okay. It, it, it's a decent trait, it's not the worst of traits. Mm. But to the rest of the nations around the Middle East, being a shepherd is, is looked down upon, mm. yeah. particularly by the Egyptians. Mm. Mm -hmm. right? it's, 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 it's a foolish vocation, yeah. right? And I want to comment on that from that percep perception, okay. right? That God um, takes up an occupation which in other cultures is contemptible, mm -hmm. right? But God himself does not disdain uh, to, 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 uh, to associate himself with such a contemptible occupation, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. right? And I think that's a, that's a true, uh, uh, a true and vivid representation of Christ's ministrations towards human beings, yes. right? That Christ, by taking the, the, the place of a servant in Philippians, according to Philippians 2, yeah. took up a disdainful occupation, mm -hmm. but he himself did not count it disdainful mm -hmm. to take it up. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, 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 and my mind is now going crazy, mm -hmm. right? And he, he takes up that disdainful occupation. And I'm saying that the act of him stooping low, mm -hmm. it's the point of him being incarnate, mm -hmm. is not new to him. Okay. Because Christ has been stooping low yeah. from the time he thought of creating us. Mm -hmm. Stooping low by making himself sure it in case we sin. Mm -hmm. And stooping low in the very act of creating us. Mm -hmm. Genesis chapter two describes a God who stoops low mm -hmm. to, 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 to mold Adam into, into a being, mm -hmm. right? And, and when David and the other psalmists call God a, a shepherd, yeah. the act of calling him a shepherd is symmetrical to the act of stooping mm -hmm. that God has been doing yeah. throughout history to relate with men. Yeah. Yeah, and, and, and for me, all the points that you bring now then make me wonder, the sheep that are being led by this shepherd seemingly want to be led. lead. Oh, okay, they are cantankerous sheep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, because there's the verse that Jason read in John 10, then says he even is willing to go take his sheep that are in other folds, folds and considering the court on missions that we were just doing previously. Jesus is willing to call his other sheep who are out there. Mm -hmm. He's the kind of shepherd who looks out for all of his sheep mm -hmm. and is willing to build that relationship with all of his sheep. In, in fact, the, the idea that's in John 10 yeah. is slightly contrary to the nationalistic feelings in the book of Psalms. Yeah. Okay. In the book of Psalms, yeah. God is sort of reduced unwittingly yeah. or wittingly into a talisman <laughs> who is used against, uh, against other, other, nations. other nations, yeah. right? But Jesus actually speaking to the, the shepherd himself, speaking to part of his flock, mm. utters a revolutionary idea to that particular flock. Because mm -hmm. he says that flock, I have other sheep who are not, not. of this fold. Mm. But when they hear my voice, they what they will listen. Yes, right. Which then tells that God's uh, percep God, God's perception of us is not provincial. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. God's perception of us is is holistic. It's yes. it's, it's corporate. It's even it's, it's universal. Yes. It includes all men of men without any creed, denomination, etc. Yes, yes. And for me, that's that that's the point that 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 excites me the most about the shepherd. Okay. Because he's a shepherd who's not only concerned about these who are here, but he also wants the sheep who are not of this fold to come. So he's not just a shepherd who takes care of those ones, but wants everyone, everyone, to come and be part of this family. And what an amazing shepherd that we have. What you're mentioning, remember this, the, this parable about him leaving the 99 to go and look out for just one. Yes. So the, that's the kind of... Yes, shepherd. that's the kind of shepherd. And he's willing, the verse again that you read, he's willing even to die for the sheep. Mm -hmm. 
I, I, I don't know about the shepherds in the Old Testament if they really actually died for, for the sheep. No, no, an example is David himself. Yeah. We see him fighting a, a lion, a, a lion a in bear. a bay yeah. on behalf of his sheep. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, so if, that's the typology. That's the typology that we find in some of, of this kind of shepherd. Let's 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 look at the other the other side, the other typology rather of, of the Messiah that we find in the book of Psalm. Uh, let's read Psalm 22, maybe just the first few verses of Psalm 22. Jason, your version is quite interesting. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Then, TK, you read Psalm 118. Verse Do you mean 22. interesting in the British way or the American way? I wonder. British way. Because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that one is, that's a, a bad interest. But anyway, um, uh, read Psalm 22. Yes. It says, my God, just verse 1. Yeah, just read verse 1 up to 3. Okay. Yeah. Um, my God, my God, why have you deserted me? Why are you so far away? Won't you listen to my groans and come to my rescue? I cry out day and night, but you don't answer, and I can never rest. Yet you are the holy God, ruling from your throne and praised by Israel. Thank you. Psalm 118. Verse 22. Yes. The stone which the builders rejected has become the chief's cornerstone. cornerstone. Um, <laughs> what are these verses talking about, right? There's, there's someone who's crying in Psalm 122. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me, right? And this is synonymous to a certain verse that we find in the New Testament. Yes. What is this uh, psalm depicting about the life of the Messiah? It clearly shows us that it would not be smooth sailing. Okay. And uh, someone here amongst us said that uh, the, 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 there was a nationalistic feeling during the New Testament, the Old Testament era. But now, this, this depict a suffering Messiah, so to speak. Yes. The, the, in the first instance, when he is crying out, Obviously, he's in pain. And we must also remember that in the New Testament, this is the same cry that Jesus uttered mm -hmm. when he was being crucified. Yes, yes. So, and it's actually a fulfillment of that, that he would be a suffering. Then the other one where we say the stone which the builders rejected, the sheep rejecting the shepherd, it gets fulfilled in the New Testament again, okay. where he lives amidst resistance mm -hmm. if, from the people he's trying to save. We, I, 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 I always remember the story of John, where if you read closely, we, 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 we begin to infer that John must have been Jesus' biological cousin on, in, on earthly terms. But he actually sent messengers to him to say, are you the one? <laughs> that, that should come or should should we wait for another? Mm -hmm. You see, so this Messiah now, people were not sure, some were refusing outright, some had doubts and so on. So when we are told that the stone which the builders rejected, I think it's a, it's a portrayal of that resistance, the persecution, the insults, the doubts, mm -hmm. and they come to, we, we come to see them being fulfilled in, in Jesus' in lifetime. Jesus okay. Yes. Yeah. I also like what, what I like. What comes out here is that uh, Im feelings are uh, amoral. Okay. They're not moral. They're not immoral. I, I can't, I can't um, judge your spirituality based on, based on what, how you feel or, or what what feelings you have. Okay. Um, I, I don't have any children I know of, but uh, those who are parents, <laughs> <laughs> uh, those who are parents say that um, there are times when. Uh, you feel like throwing your kids out of the window, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but <laughs> does that make you a bad parent? No, it doesn't. Oh, as long as you don't, as, yeah, long as, you don't as long as you don't throw <laughs> your kids out of the window or, or, or plan to in your in your head. But sometimes a feeling like that will come because children are, are frustrating. Okay. Okay. So I mean, well, I I am I am somebody's child. I mean, every child at some point has felt like you know beating their parents up, mm. you know. But they they are. <laughs> And it's incredible about God that when he, when he inspired the people who wrote these psalms and also took part in the pre preservation 
of these psalms for us to read. He didn't take out the psalms that had, um, he didn't take out the psalms that put him at risk of having bad PR. Okay. Yeah. So you have the psalm in which the psalmist is crying, my God, my God, why have you left me? Yes. And at first you think, man, that sounds so irreverent, but they're they're expressing a a feeling that they have. And Jesus on the cross himself, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Mm -hmm. And that's, he's expressing his feeling. Um, In our part of the world here in Africa, uh, uh, you're not supposed to express those kind of feelings to your superiors, be they your parents, your bosses, your pastor, your elder, or, or your political leaders. And I think that's a weakness. Of course, we must um, give kudos to our cultures mm. for uh, their respect for authority. Mm-hmm. No, no matter how smart you are, you have to have somebody to look up to. Otherwise, mm. you end up running around in circles. Mm. But at the same time, it, in fact, it's difficult to continue respecting an authority when you can't express um, uh, feelings that most people would deem, as, deem immoral. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And yet God is com- so comfortable with that yeah. that he, he has it recorded. Yeah. And, and, and we also see the extent of Jesus' suffering, right? Okay. When you read the Psalms, you say, oh, yeah, he's portrayed as someone who's going to suffer. But we see even the extent of his suffering when it comes to the Garden of Gethsemane. He expresses those feelings, Lord, if possible. Yeah. Let this cup pass before me. Yeah. He was so expressive of it because he had suffered so much. And so in the Psalms, he's depicted as a suffering Messiah who not only suffered uh, uh, within himself, but most of the suffering that he went through was being uh, caused by the people that he had come to save. Yes. And that's the worst part of it. Right. Um, okay. Uh, the question I wanted to answer or ask it in ask, answer yeah. right, <laughs> was, <laughs> was um, okay, the, uh, how are we jumping at the conclusion that Psalm 22 is messianic? Oh, okay. 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 I think that's a fair question to oh, ask. Yeah, yes, because yeah. I think we can't shake off the feeling that at times we're just shoehorning, uh, we, <laughs> we may be shoehorning things yeah. to yeah. fit our own narratives, okay. right? The argument that... Um, Psalm 22 verse 1 is messianic, comes from the fact that there is no situation in David's life that may tally with the details of that particular psalm. Okay. Okay. Right? Yeah. In fact, if you read verses 1 to 16, then from verses 17 to the last verse, yeah. you will then see two bits. There's a first bit about the forsaken one. Mm. And the one who seems to have been forsaken in that manner, mm. in the whole of scripture, mm is Jesus. Okay. Then even the last part there that talks about him being um, reviled and rejected, right? Um, there are corresponding texts in the Bible that, that agree with that. Okay. Just as also Psalm 118 verse 22, which says that the, the chief, the, the headstone or the chief cornerstone, which the builders, what? Rejected. rejected. Christ himself actually quotes that verbatim. Okay, let me read that. Mm. That's Matthew chapter 21, verse 42. And, and he said, uh, the Bible says, Jesus said unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures that the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Mm. Therefore say I, I unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof, mm-hmm. right? And, and this is Christ himself, yeah. where he's actually speaking in the context of the religious leaders of the time, and Israel, Israel large in a sense, the re- rejection of his ministry. Mm. And then he then quotes what had been said in the Psalms, word for word. Okay. In a sense, he was actually saying to them, on account of rejecting me, you have rejected the cornerstone. Okay. You are the builders who we predicted of, mm-hmm. and on account of that, the kingdom of God shall pass from you. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So that is sort of the biblical evidence that we have. That Psalm 118, not all of it, of course, but Psalm 22, most of it, is messianic based based on what I have just said. Okay. Okay. Uh, I like the part where you said most of it. Yeah. 
Yeah, because I wanted to ask that <laughs> is the whole Psalm 22 yeah. talking about the life of Jesus or there are beats in Psalm 22 that talk about the life of David. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And and for me the key in Psalm 22 that then also portrays that hmm, this is talking about the Messiah is Psalm 22 verse 16 and you mentioned it, right? Yeah. I think let's read Psalm 22 verse 16. Then we can see that no, David didn't go through this. Psalm 22 verse 16. Okay. Yeah. Verse 16 says um for dogs have surrounded me. The assembly of the wicked have encircled me. They pierced my hands and my feet. Yeah, and we know that David's hands and feet were not pierced. Uh, right, and, and let's talk about the dogs there. Okay, okay. I, I think the dogs there is metaphoric. Mm -hmm. Not even just metaphoric. It's actually uh, Jewish speak. When Jews call Gentiles, they called Gentiles dogs. dogs. Even Christ himself, remember, talking to the Phoenician woman. Yes. He says, uh, why should we give food for the children to the, the, dogs. To, to the dogs? So it was Jewish speak. Yes. That's a kind of rough speak, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Jewish speak. They didn't love their dogs like we do. Yeah. Dogs were, dogs were yeah. 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 Right. So, so in, in at the cross, yeah. the people were actually surrounding Jesus beyond the Jews were actually the Roman soldiers. Mm -hmm who were literally in Jewish yes. speak with dogs, as in the Gentiles. Yes. yes. Right? And at his, at, and at, at his death, yes. the people who were really around him were, 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 were Gentiles. Yeah. I can also comment on the cornerstone. Okay. Right? Yeah. yeah. I, I never did building at school, mm. but, but I know this from, from life in general. <laughs> right? Uh, um, the chief cornerstone is the stone that uh, supports and uplifts the entire structure. Um. Right. Without it, the whole thing collapses. Okay. In the quick analysis of the Jewish economy, when I say economy, I'm not just I'm talking about economics. I'm talking about economy as a way of life. Mm -hmm. Representations of Jesus mm -hmm. were the cornerstone of, of of their entire economy. Okay. Okay. To the extent that to reject Jesus is to make a mockery of the entirety of their belief system. Okay. Okay. Right. Yes. So they who were in the temple, their very presence in the temple, mm -hmm. right, speaks to an, an unwitting belief in Jesus. Yes. So therefore, for, for Jesus then to then come to that very same temple and they reject him, mm -hmm. bespeaks the fact that the builders of the faith mm -hmm. were not understanding what they were building. Yes. Yes. I hope that makes sense, yes. right? Yes. Which explains even when Christ then says that yeah, Solomon's temple was wow. Mm -hmm. But this one, which you guys wept when after it had been rebuilt, right? People they wept in Hakai. Yes, they actually wept. I, they actually wept. Yeah. Because the elders who had seen uh, the, or the head, Solomon's temple, uh, the or head of Solomon's of temple, Lord of Solomon's temple. temple. They, they all wept. Yeah. But Christ then says that temple, with all its shortcomings, was more glorious than Solomon's yes. temple. Yes. Why? Because in it, type met anti-type. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Right, and yet the people who were presiding over that economy had no clue of it. Yeah. I like John 3, mm. where Jesus speaks to Nicodemus, who is explaining to, to a leader, leader of the house. Of the house. <laughs> he ends up saying, ah, you are a teacher of Israel, mm. but you do not understand mm. these things. Mm. Then he then continues, he then says, uh, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Yeah. His argument was, you as a teacher of Israel, mm. you are a builder. Mm. And you should have known that all these things rest on me. Yes. But you don't know. You don't know. And, and you know what you say is quite interesting because their whole religious system yes. was founded on the idea of the coming Messiah. Yeah. So as they were giving the sheep and the gods for sacrifices, they were actually pointing to a coming Messiah who will save them from their sin. Yeah. The chief cornerstone that they rejected. <laughs> okay. Uh, so you'll notice that uh, I, I want us to connect the idea that the same Jesus had uh, made a covenant with their fathers. Okay. Abraham made a covenant with Abraham and the covenant was passed down through the ages. Let's see the idea of the covenant also as we come to the book of Psalm. Let's read Psalm uh, 89, verse 27 to 32. Verse 27 to what? To 32. 32. Okay, yes. verse 27, the Bible says, uh, also, I'll make him my firstborn, yes. the highest of the kings of the earth. I'll keep my mercy for him forevermore, and my covenant will stand firm with him. 
I'll also cause his offspring to remain forever and his throne as long as the days of heaven. If his children forsake my law and do not walk in my judgments, if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments, then I will punish their transgression with a rod and their wickedness with blows. Okay. Uh, it's a covenant which is talking about the house of David. Am I okay. right? Yes. Uh, which is also called the Davidic covenant. Right. What is the Davidic covenant all about? Right. What does it speak to? I, I think it, uh, in a simplistic manner, yes. God actually promised David that he will continue and protect his lineage, his kingdom, he, his dynasty, so to speak. Okay. Um, and uh, I, I, for a certain time, really, things were going well. Uh, David, then Solomon. Oh, but thereafter, first the, 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 the nation broke into two, and then they came captivity, and it appeared as though now the covenant had been broken. Had been broken. Okay. And uh, we, we know, I think we have the benefit of hindsight as well now, that God does not break his promises or covenants. Okay. So now, when that, I am sure for at a certain time, to some people, the covenant, the covenant then did not make sense. They were saying, why is God allowing? He, he promised now not to break this lineage to our father, David. Okay. When he, they were, the, the kingdom broke down and they were taken into captivity, but the promise lingered. Therefore, the coming of Jesus now as a descendant of J D David and as the Messiah was in a sense a continuation and fulfillment of that covenant. Okay. We, we have this personal family covenant, so to speak, now also merging into the messianic covenant, so to speak. I, I, I only answered it in a, simpli okay. in a simplistic yeah, manner. Yeah, just following well, what you're saying, and probably the questions, the comments that are going to come through on that, is the idea that the Davidic co covenant is David was king on the throne mm -hmm. in Israel. Yeah. Solomon was king on the throne in Israel. But as we come down and we say, Jesus, the Messiah, is the son of David, so he must ascend to the throne. Even the disciples thought Jesus was the one who would ascend to the throne and deliver them from Roman oppression. But Jesus was never king. He never ascended to the throne on earth. So how do we say the Davidic covenant is fulfilled, fulfilled in, in Jesus, Jesus Christ, yet he never was king of Judah or Israel here on earth? Well, it all begins in Genesis 3, yeah. where there's a promise made to the couple, yeah. to the, I like to call them the earthling and the woman. Okay. So there's a promise made to the earthling and the woman and that, that uh, the seed would come to crush the serpent. Okay. The, and the seed there is, is singular, if I remember well. Yes, yes, it is. <clears throat> so there's a, there's a looking forward for, lo looking forward to a man who is coming to, to, to do what Adam failed to do. Okay. Yeah. And you can even see it in the name they gave Cain. There was an expectation that this guy could be the one, yes. but he wasn't. So you're following the line throughout the Old Testament. Mm. Um, but then to cut a long story short, there's a narrowing because when you, when you meet, when you come to Exodus, the book of Exodus, yes. uh, the son of God, the son of God, the son of man, son of God, uh, is um, is the nation of Israel because yeah. he says to Pharaoh, because you're oppressing my firstborn Israel, yeah. I'm going to oppress yours. Okay. And but then when you get to the time of the king of David, it's narrowed down to a particular line okay. within, which is the difficulty which comes at the end of the Old Testament, <clears throat> because the Old Testament ends in failure. Yeah. Um, why do I say that? There are three Abrahamic religions in the world. All of them take the Old Testament seriously, but okay. all of them have other writings beyond the Old Testament. Old Testament. And so the Old Testament ends in expectation to say um, there's, there's, a, there's a king who is coming mm -hmm. and uh, who, who's going to be the son of God. And when you look especially in the story of Matthew, because Matthew is believed to have written to a mostly Jewish audience, mm -hmm. he goes to great pains throughout to show that this is the son of the son, the son of God. This is the this is the son of for. David who've been waiting for, and you can see it in A, B, C, D throughout okay. his life. Okay, thank you for that. Yeah, right. Okay. Uh, Psalm eighty-nine, verse twenty-seven. Yes, says that. Um, 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 twenty-seven says, "Also, I'll make him my firstborn." 
mm-hmm. the highest of the kings of the of the earth mm-hmm. right i like verse uh, 26 it says you cry out to me saying you are my father my god the rock of my salvation, salvation. then verse 27 says i'll make him my firstborn okay. the highest uh, of all the kings of the of the earth okay and then colossians 1 verse 15 paul then comes and clarifies things and says that christ is the firstborn of all creation yes so in firstborn day it does not mean that uh, he's the um, he was born as when I say born as in he's a he's a creature he's a creature yeah right but yeah. born the first born day means that uh he he has preeminence it's the foremost. Over, yes he's a foremost over all creation okay 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 right okay. so from that concept the promise made to david that david covenant starts off in second samuel 7 mm. verse 13 mm. 14 and then verse 16 also where a promise is made to david by god that i will establish the kingdom mm. forever forever yes right in the forever element is not derived from the participation in the actions of of the humans in that line yeah. because all of them die yeah but the 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 the, 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 the it, it, eternal element is brought to david david's line by jesus okay right okay. in evidence of it Matthew chapter 1 what what uh, Matthew chapter 1 right yeah, yeah Matthew that, chapter one. that yeah. that uh, that uh, Jason was alluding to he explained Matthew argues out quite well that Jesus is a descendant of who? David. of of David. David then look in Luke chapter 3 mm. right <laughs> when he then has to explain to the gentiles who Jesus is mm. he takes it further than what Matthew had done and traces Jesus to before Adam okay okay <laughs> you, you get it yeah and that's where you then see how jesus is is the firstborn mm. he appears before adam mm. and appears way after adam is jesus yes right so he, he, so so that is how the davidic covenant is what is 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 eternal in a sense okay right then probably one one just one small comment there yeah. speaking about the differences between the davidic covenant in the other other covenants there's the noahic covenant the abrahamic covenant yeah what makes the davidic covenant quite interesting is how it juxtaposes conditionality and unconditionality okay right that christ would that christ, david's throne would be established forever mm-hmm. is an unconditional promise mm. it's a promise that that would would succeed in spite of the characters in the line mm-hmm. okay in fact, let's just read the genealogy in Jesus of Matthew chapter 1 for yourself. Yeah. To, to talk to you and the viewers. <laughs> you note that that genealogy is packed with cantankerous characters. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, if you to go back to the one in Luke, mm. when you trace it backwards up to way up to Adam, there are, there are so many reasons for God to, to take it away from that line. Mm. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. For example, it, at some point it looks like it will fail. Remember when Judah is refusing to honor his son who is died. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm right what ends up happening that even in spite of them a child is born from incest mm-hmm. yeah right the whole line the whole line yeah until even christ himself is what is born yeah and what simply comes out there is the fact that the promise that god had made to david and the promise that god had made even to to adam and eve at the fall yeah. right was not conditional upon their performance okay but was reliant upon his faithfulness his faithfulness but at the same time there is also a, a part of it which then is also conditional okay. for example read um it's verse what uh, verse, verse 30 if his children forsake my law okay and do not walk in my judgments mm-hmm. if they break my statutes and do not keep my commandments then i'll punish their transgression with the road and their wickedness with blows then verse 33, nevertheless, I will not completely forsake my loving kindness from him and allow my faithfulness to fail. Okay. Right. So there's a condition though also. There is a part where these guys need to, to obey. To do their part. Failing which certain blows would, would hit them. Okay. But because of his faithfulness based on, his, on the unconditionality of the promise. Yes. That which is conditional, however, whatever its failings, will not supersede that which is what unconditional no. right so even what jason was talking about when he says that uh, when the old testament comes to an end mm. it sort of ends in defeat mm. it does not 
however defeats the whole purpose in the New Testament of God, these glories that didn't come in the New Testament mm. because of the faithfulness of the unconditional part of the Davidic covenant. The Davidic covenant. Yeah. Okay. yeah, and so, okay. Ah, okay. 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 I, I just wanted to mention, you, you asked why we say Jesus is king. There's also a reference, I think, uh, in the Psalm 110 okay. to the aspect of comparing Jesus to Melchizedek, yes. who was both king and high priest. Mm, yeah. So that aspect also is important because in the New Testament, I think it must be in Hebrews as well. Hebrews 7. It, Hebrews 7. I, I think a great chunk of Hebrews 7 then also says that Jesus and Melchizedek have some common commonalities that if you read Genesis 14, you, you are told that Melchizedek was the king of Salem and then he also acts as a priest, priest. which combination you can only find in Christ Jesus, because while he is our king and son of God, he also intercedes for us. So that, that, that's part of the evidence. And then we, we have this great movement of um, some of our colleagues in contemporary times who try to separate the messianic prophecies of the Old Testament to this Jesus in the New Testament, whom they claim it does not subscribe to some of the laws of the Old Testament. I think this comparison that we are making of the Psalms, that they prophesied of Jesus, they, 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 they talked of Jesus, it dispels that myth that uh, maybe the Jesus of the, Old, the New Testament is different from the Messiah that was predicted in the Old Testament. Okay. I, I thought I, I should make mention of that. Okay. And I think yeah, yeah. this is also going to benefit some of us who have had difficulty as well in reading the Old Testament, saying maybe it's difficult to understand. This opens our eyes because it's seems the gospel is also there in the Old okay. Testament. Okay, okay, thank okay. you. Uh, uh, no, no. Maybe Jason, you, you, it's now sorted. Sort of, yeah. It's sort of, okay, no, come through. Okay, <laughs> I, I just wanted to even the, the, the structure of the compilation yeah. of the Psalms itself comes up because when the Psalm starts off, uh, it starts off in the temple, if you're reading Psalm 2, yeah. which is temple language. And then the complaining Psalms come up, I think, mostly in Book 1, mm. uh, where life happens. So as a, as a, it, it, there's a journey of the believer. You start off in the temple, everything is nice, mm. and then you go out and you complain and you complain, but the, you praise as well. But it ends back in, in, in the sanctuary, but in the heavenly sanctuary now. Yeah. Where, and in, tied in with that is this hope for the son of David. So again, you find the, the, the priestly function and the kingly function joined together. Okay. In the Levitical, pre, the Levitical priesthood didn't have any coercive power, yes. which was unique in, amongst the people whom they lived with. Yeah. Um, because the, in the Egyptian system, the, the Pharaoh actually came from the priestly class. Yeah. But God divided the kingly power and the priestly power so that it's important for us to learn God's character without, his, without being distracted by his power. Yeah. And then later, now that we've learned, it's, it's okay to bring them together because we not only want a high priest who can sympathize with us, but one who has the power to, oh, yes. to yes. bring about what, he, what, what is coming up, which is, which is really cool about Jesus being in the, in the, uh, in, in the order of Melchizedek. Yeah, it's, it's, the, thing, the, the, the ideas that you're that you raising, I think they're important for us to then close with that to then ask, uh, what, what can we say to skeptics? The Bible is clear about the role of Jesus as the king and the Messiah. The Messiah, the king, and the priest, the high priest particularly. But if you not, Psalm 110 starts off by saying, the Lord said to my Lord. And it's bringing out a picture of Jesus as divine. Mm -hmm. Jesus is God. But when they look at Jesus, they just say he was another prophet. Yet the prophecies speak to Jesus as divine. Not just divine, he's divine, he's powerful, he has authority, he's also a priest ministering on our behalf. What can we say to skeptics who still doubt the divinity of Jesus and the role of Jesus as the priest? Okay. To say that we have a Jesus, the same Jesus is going, is ministering on our behalf, and at the same time is God. Uh, my, my, my view, yeah. it's, a, it's a crazy view anyway. Yeah is that um, if we are wrong, that Jesus is God, so what? Okay, okay. 
yeah we come to your right hand say Jesus is God worship him mm. you worship him then we all die and in our death we figure out that is we are dying because he wasn't God so what <laughs> right. but we tell you now that Jesus is God and mm-hmm. you and you disagree with us yes and and the predictions predicted in the bible that will happen to those who disbelieve him yeah happen then what right so my point is believe the word is 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 written is written yeah. is is written yeah. Yeah. you stand to lose nothing yeah yeah you have got everything to gain yeah. if what you are saying is true yeah yeah uh, and just to add um when when uh, the, the 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 text that we read earlier it says therefore i say to you the kingdom of god will be taken to you from you and given to a nation bearing the fruits of it and whoever falls on this stone will be broken but on whomever it falls it will grind him to powder that's a message for the skeptic <laughs> from Matthew <laughs> Matthew 21 verse, verse 40 that's a threat <laughs> no I, I merely read the scripture it's Matthew 21 verse, verses 43 and 44 it's I merely read your, this it's not your words it's, it's, it's not, not your handwriting yeah. yeah yeah it's the inspired writing <laughs> I, w- I would I would say yeah. try him out because he himself has uh, uh, challenged to say look if, if you yeah. if you think you know better come let's let's have a debate yeah. and uh, I, yeah. I'll I'll fix you up and you'll be you'll be better than you were before but also God has never has never expected us to believe him on the basis of mere claims he always provides evidence yeah. and Jesus himself on the road to Emmaus was able to not only pick from Moses and the prophets but to pick from the Psalms as well to show them how they were fulfilled in his life death and resurrection I thank you so much I think for me the key takeaway from this lesson is the idea that the same Jesus that we probably reject is where our hope of salvation is. That's our only hope for salvation. Yeah. And key takeaway for today's lesson is the unity of the scriptures, the fact that what the Old Testament says is fulfilled in the New Testament. Therefore, the Bible can be trusted, that there is a power beyond the Bible that inspired the writings of those words. And if we take it to heart, read carefully, then God will be able to enable us to understand the scriptures very well. Thank you so much for the insightful discussions. Let us pray as we close our session. Thank you, Lord, for helping us to study your word. We pray that may you help us to understand and to continue studying. And to the viewers, Lord, minister to them and to them in a special way that your Holy Spirit may enable them to understand your word as we also seek understanding. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.